Hello. Nina, 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 Nina. 18 month old Davinda and his baby brother Ravinda were the sons of successful businessman Neil Chowan. <laughs> With a loving marriage to his wife Nancy, Neil had everything a man could want. <laughs> but in February 2003, just two days after this film was shot, all five members of this happy family simply disappeared. Vanished without a trace. Three generations of one family. Chowans are now at the centre of a major police hunt. Why would anybody want to simply walk away and leave it all behind? This is the story of a man who made an entire family disappear. Detectives later found evidence of the macabre journey. Two members of an underworld. The story of an extraordinary deception by a ruthless criminal who wanted to get rich at any cost. He had absolutely no moral conscience whatsoever. A man who almost succeeded in outwitting the police by committing a crime so unique and horrific, no one dared to believe it had taken place. The prosecution had described the crimes as beyond belief. In 2003, businessman Neil Chowan was the owner of a successful fruit importation firm based at Heathrow called Seba Freight. With a wife and two children, Chowan was known to his staff as a contented family man and an easygoing boss. Neil's way of running the company was a relaxed, sort of like happy go lucky attitude. We all mucked in. Whenever it was busy, he'd get pizzas, get drinks. Everyone is sort of like, like one big happy family. But owning a freight company had made Neil Chowan a target. In January 2003, a recently released convict arrived at Seba Freight looking for work. His name was Kenneth Regan. You must be Ken. That's me. You're Mr. Chowan, right? Neil Chowan had spent time in prison for tax evasion and was sympathetic to the ex-con who said he wanted to go straight. Neil was a very fair person. He'd, he'd, he'd always give people not a second chance, but a tenth chance. He'd been in prison himself and obviously he'd had a second chance, so why shouldn't anybody else? Ken came on as a uh, driver. Not frightened of getting his hands dirty and as a worker, I thought he was, he was good. But Kenneth Regan was no ordinary delivery driver. Five years earlier, Regan had been a successful drug smuggler, known to his friends as Captain Cash. In the late 90s, Ken Regan was a career criminal. Regan set up freight companies in around uh, the Heathrow area, and he'd use those as a front to bring drugs into the country. He knew most of the major criminals in London and criminal families, and he was very much living the, the high life. It was in a fashionable London bar that Regan first met celebrity agent and socialite Belinda Bruin. He was a bit rough, I think. Not, not well-educated, quite charming, dressed well, nice watch, spent a lot of money. He was kind of like a, a, a rich, wide boy. Regan's nickname was Captain Cash. He always had a lot of money, and I mean high denomination notes. He had a briefcase, and I'd seen that twice, and it was just full of money. And I think he thought it bought in class when he had none whatsoever. Belinda would eventually be drawn unwittingly into Regan's world of crime and deceit. It started when the gangster became obsessed with her. He used to phone me quite a lot and emails saying, I've never, I haven't felt like this in 30 years. You're like a drug, I can't. I mean, just bizarre, considering that he didn't really know me at all. And then one day, a friend of mine said to me, um, 
why on earth are you going out with someone like Regan? And I said to him, I'm not. And he said, well, he told me that you're his girlfriend. And I said, you've got to be kidding. And he said, no, I'm not. Which I found slightly worrying. And then literally, I think a few days later, he got arrested. June the 17th, 1998, Regan was caught with 25 kilograms of heroin. Facing 18 years in prison, he decided to become a grass. Regan's testimony helped convict 12 major criminals while his own sentence was reduced. By the time he was released from prison four years later, Captain Cash had few friends and little money. When Regan was released from his prison sentence, he'd very much gone back to having nothing. All his assets had been stripped from him as part of the confiscation order. And here he was, back living in one bedroom of a very small bungalow with his father. Regan, I think, very much wanted to get back in the driving seat as a drug importer. Mr. Chohan's business was, was the perfect framework to hang his drug dealing activities on. Regan came up with a plan to steal Neil Chohan's company. A plan so ruthless that no one would realize it had taken place. He began by setting a trap. Soon after starting work at Seba, Regan approached Chohan and said he knew some investors who wanted to buy the company. The bait was a cash offer of three million pounds, a large enough sum to tempt the businessman whose wife Nancy wanted him to retire. I've got investors. I, I knew that um, Nancy wanted to go back to India. She'd, she'd made it clear she, she missed India. Um, and we talked about it a couple of times because he, he did say that the, the level of education in India w was higher than the UK and uh, Nancy was desperate to go back there. Okay. While Chowan considered his offer, Regan began working on the next phase of his plan. Seba Freight was not the only thing he wanted to acquire. By this time, Belinda Bruin had given up her house in Chelsea for a new life in Devon. Regan's obsessive calls and letters had stopped during his four years in prison, but now free, he began to pursue Belinda once more. A few weeks after he got out of prison, he left me a, a few messages on my mobile. He said that he had a business deal he wished to discuss with me. And at the time, I had this huge house, a huge mortgage, and two kids at private school when I'd given up my job and then my boyfriend left me. So I was, it was, uh, how can I put it? Yes, um, so I rang him. Regan told Belinda he was planning to take over Seba Freight and needed a new managing director. Although she had no relevant experience, Regan offered her a huge salary for a two-day week. At first, he offered me 50 four thousand pounds which is a lot of money but i thought you know i've got two kids at private school and a huge mortgage that's not going to cover everything and so he said fine i'll pay you seventy-two thousand. and i thought well that's great the job offer gave regan an excuse to visit belinda at her isolated devon home he'd come up with bizarre reasons like he'd want me to sign a letter or a form or he'd want me to help him fill in a form. And he'd drive all the way from Salisbury or from London to my house for 20 minutes. Regan seemed to become strangely fixated on the land around Belinda's farm. He used to moan about the mud a lot. The mud in the lane, you know, I couldn't live here, it's so disgusting. He wanted to cut down some of the trees and build a nice wall and electric gates. I mean, this was an old farmhouse, not a footballer's pad in Essex. He kept saying, I could make this place really, really nice for you. What you need is a drainage ditch. By February, Chowan had made up his mind. He would meet the investors that Regan said wanted to buy his company. On the Thursday morning before Valentine's Day, he left his office telling staff he had a meeting at Stonehenge. He said, uh, I'm, I'm going off to do a deal. 
um, and sell the company. He said, then I'll, uh, I'll let you know. And uh, that was the last time I saw him. On Monday morning, the employees at SIBO were greeted with a shock announcement. I came in on shift on Monday. We all gathered around and Belinda was introduced as the new owner of the company by Ken. It came as a shock to everyone. It was something we were expecting, you know? Everyone was thinking what had happened to Anil, where, where he had gone. Is it real that he sold the company or what about our jobs? And so many things happening at the same time. Regan produced a letter which explained that Chowan had sold the company and was retiring abroad with Nancy due to ill health. It bore the signature of Neil Chowan. Well, because of it being a busy company, you couldn't sort of uh, sit down and start whinging about it or, or do anything about it. You just had to go and get on with the work because it was a busy company. You would have to get on with the work and get the work done. Belinda was given a desk and a computer and began examining the books as Regan had asked her to. But on her second day, she felt ill. Instead of going to Seba, where Regan was expecting her, she drove home to Devon. When I pulled into the drive, I couldn't believe it. There was this old beaten up Jaguar, and I thought, what on earth is going on here? And I saw these two guys in my field with a digger. The two men were William Hornsey and Peter Rees, both friends of Ken Regan. I went absolutely mad. And I, I swore a lot. And I said, you know, what on earth did they think they were doing? And he said, well, we're building you a drainage ditch. You know, there's this bloody great big ditch in the middle of my field running along the side of the hedge. I just couldn't believe it. Regan arrived. I said, you know, it's not the fact that I might not need a drainage ditch. It was my land. You never asked my permission. You just don't go digging up people's land. He said, well, I thought you would appreciate it. I mean, it just looked like a car park, you know? I just hated it. But I was going to have it taken up. Um, and they said, wait till the summer. But as it happened, the Metropolitan Police dug it up for me. In 2003, convicted drug smuggler Kenneth Regan was on the verge of regaining his former millionaire's lifestyle. Neil Chowan, the previous owner of Seba Freight, had disappeared. Now Regan was in control of his bonded warehouse, an ideal front for importing drugs. For five years, Regan had been obsessed by socialite Belinda Bruin from afar, but now she was on his payroll. It seemed as if Regan's dreams had all come true, but the secret behind his success was about to be exposed. 12,000 miles away, Onka Verma was working as a journalist in New Zealand. His sister Nancy was raising a family in England with her husband, Neil Chowan and Onka was planning to visit the family for the very first time. I was very excited because I was going to see Nancy after nine years, and it was like a family reunion after a long time. Onka used to speak to his sister and mother almost every day, but on the 15th of February, the phone calls simply stopped. When I was trying to get hold of Nancy, I was trying to get hold of mom, and nobody was there. So, you know, I thought something's not right. Concerned for his family's safety, Onka contacted the Metropolitan Police. A routine missing persons inquiry established that the family home was empty, but neighbors and colleagues seemed to think the Chowans had all gone to India. You have to remember that if people wish to leave a country and relocate to somewhere else, then it's their right to do so. In this particular inquiry, um, 
of friends and family in the UK were very much of a belief that Mr Chohan had decided to do that. Onka decided that if the police couldn't find his family, he would fly to Britain to investigate the disappearances himself. Alone in a country he'd never been to before, Onka went to the family home in Hounslow and was shocked by what he discovered. As I entered the house, I could see the kids twice on the floor, the baby feed bottles, all the baby feed and the clothes, they, they were still in the house. I opened the fridge, there was uncooked food inside. Onka became even more suspicious when he discovered his mother's most treasured possession. My mom's prayer book was there inside the house. That was something strange because my mom used to carry it with her all the time. One thing I couldn't figure out that how would a family disappear? We're talking about two, three adults and two kids, you know, two babies. And how can they just disappear without telling me? With compelling evidence that his family had left the house against their will, Onka went to the police and convinced them to launch a full investigation. DCI Andy Rowell began his inquiry by interviewing the last person who was known to have seen Chowan on the day he disappeared. Kenneth Regan. Mr. Regan told us that Mr. Chohan was trying to sell his business, and he was very much trying to steer it down the lines of that uh, Mr. Chohan was an unsavory businessman who had, who had got himself into deep water financially and that had, had no other choice, really, but to disappear. But detectives were unconvinced by Regan's story. Using new forensic technology, they were able to track the movements of both Regan and Chowan's mobile phones on the day of the disappearance. Initially, we could see Mr. Chohan's telephone was in the Hounslow area. We then tracked the phone down to the Stonehenge area. Now, of course, Mr. Regan lived not far from Stonehenge in a, in a village called Wilton in Salisbury. And what we could see is that Regan's telephone met up with Mr. Chohan's telephone. And then the two telephones traveled from that meeting point, further down into the West Country towards Exeter. The only lead the detectives had in Devon was that it was home to the new managing director of SEBA, Belinda Bruin. They decided to pay her a visit. When Regan found out that the police were coming to my house, he was furious. And he said to me, you know, you mustn't allow the police to come to your house. They'll just cause you aggravation. Um, you know, once they get a foot in your house, you mustn't let them come to your house. I want you to phone them back and go and meet them somewhere else. And I thought, well, why would I want to do that? Later that day, DCI Andy Rowell received a phone call from Regan's associate. I've got some information about Neil Chowan. William Halsey claimed he'd recently spoken to Neil Chowan and that the missing businessman was still in the UK. I don't know, but he told me he's on the run. Mr Halsey had told me that he was going to meet with Mr Chohan in Newport in Wales by the passport office to supply him with stolen passports. So what he was saying to us was is that he was happy to deliver Mr Chohan into our hands. And then what happened was I got a phone call from DRL saying, listen, thank you very much, Blind, but we won't be coming to see you today. We have other information, and in fact, we probably won't need to come and see you at all. Regan then rang me up, Hi. obviously to check, to make sure that the police had cancelled their meeting, and he seemed to know that they had, and I said, yes, they're not coming. He said, yes, I know, they're going to go to Wales and arrest Neil Chohan. So that was the end of that. The meeting with Chowan was due to take place on Easter Monday. But over the weekend, Belinda received an unexpected visit from Regan, Hornsey and Rees. Regan 
Megan said, I'm going to do the lane by your stables, which actually did need um, graveling, and that would have been a great place for the gravel. So I thought, well, OK. So when a digger arrived, I wasn't... It, it didn't surprise me because I thought, oh, they're going to come and grade the lane. And it was a Saturday and I took the kids into town and I let them get on with it. Two days later, detectives travelled to the spot where Hornsey said he was planning to meet Chowan. In Newport, um, where the passport of it is, there's quite an iconic bronze statue of a pig. And that's where Hornsey said that he would bring Mr Chowhan to notice. On the day in question, he in fact turned up with Mr Regan as well, and the pair of them stood there for some moments. They then enacted receiving a phone call and a text, and then made it plainly obvious through their body language that something had gone wrong with the, the arrangement. And they explained they'd received a phone call from someone saying, we know you've told the police we're friends of Neil's or Anil Chohan's. Um, the deal's off. Police traced the calls, but only to an unregistered phone. They were no closer to finding Neil Chohan, and all they knew for certain was that they had been led on a wild goose chase. I don't think, personally, he was having a swipe at the police and the, the, the sort of the subtle joke about pigs. I hope not, anyway. While Regan returned to work at Seba, the police reverted to their original plan and called in Belinda Bruin for questioning. D.I. Rao said to me, I want to have a full and frank discussion with you. And as I was leaving, Regan said to me, listen, Belinda, if the police ask you what I was doing on your land, he said, you're to tell, he said, just tell them that I was helping you with your water system. I thought that was very odd. I mean, he'd said he'd look at it, but no work had been done on it. And I just thought it was odd. When I went to meet the police, they said to me, what do you think's happened? And I said, well, I don't really know. I said, I've told you everything that I know. And he said, is there anything else that you think is odd? And I said, well, when I was leaving today, Regan asked me not, it said that if you were to ask what he was doing on my land, I was to say that he'd been working on my water system. And they said, well, what was he doing? And I said, he dug a drainage ditch. And the two of them looked at each other and said, he did what? Detectives rushed to Tiverton, convinced that a gruesome discovery awaited them on Belinda's farm. We exhumed the dig site, painstaking fingertip forensic examination, using highly trained uh, forensic archaeologists and pathologists. The murder squad spent the next five days digging in Belinda's field, but the bodies they had expected to find were nowhere to be seen. In April 2003, police had been searching for the Chowan family for over two months, but they'd been looking in the wrong place. We planned to go out for an evening's canoeing. Nice, quiet day, nice calm sea, pleasantly warm at the time of year. Yes, yeah, so it was an enjoyable evening that uh, we decided to venture out further than what we normally would do. After a short while, I noticed something floating in the sea. It appeared to be three floating objects, which at a distance was unusual. You know, as, as we were sort of just canoeing around looking about, I had noticed something, but I just totally discarded it. It wasn't until he sort of shouted body at me, I was just like, what? As I approached them, I realised that it was obviously a body. Uh, a large body because it was oversized, somewhat inflated but the feet were floating out of the water. 
and the torso. The head was face downwards in the water. He got me to go in, um, call up 999. I determined to stay with the body, um, come what may. Um, but I did expect the rescue service would have been there sooner rather than later. We have been in the water canoeing in the dark for nearly three hours. It does get a bit unnerving. You can't ignore a body once you find a body, it's, it's there. So I think I'm going to still see that body floating. The body was taken to a mortuary in Bournemouth, but it would be almost a week before it was identified as that of missing businessman Neil Chowan. I went to Bournemouth and saw the body. The first time I had a look on. Neil's face. I could I could see that he suffered a tragic death. He was he suffered a violent death. He had received a blunt trauma injury to the back of his head. He had had packing tape wound round his mouth. But uh, the main blow to the head followed by a subsequent suffocation, is the likely cause of death for Mr. Chohan. While Neil Chohan's clothes were removed for forensic analysis, a hundred miles away, police were still searching for evidence that his body had been buried in Belinda Bruin's field. The site of the dig obviously became extremely important, and we recovered some substantial evidence from that dig site, namely hairs, uh, from their burnt clothing, jewellery, which suggested that it had, in fact, been a burial site. Those hairs were subsequently identified as Mr Chohan's. He had been murdered. At some stage, he had been placed in the grave down in Devon, that he had been exhumed from that grave at a later date, put into a boat, the boat had gone out into the middle of the bay at Bournemouth and dumped it into the sea. Until his body was found, we all hoped that he would be back one day. Even if he had sold the company or not, he would still be back one day just to, to visit us or what, whatever. But when his body was found, you had just lost all hope and that was it, it was the end of, end of him. But then our concerns sort of we knew what happened to Neil, but then our concerns drifted towards Nancy and the kids and the mother. The fact that the dig site was so big, and that if, if you had wanted just to hide one body, you wouldn't need it to have gone to the extent of digging such a huge site. Coupled with the fact the entire family had gone missing. Coupled with the fact there had been a bonfire there, and that we had recovered some items of jewelry which we believe to belong to Nancy. And also there was some small poppers found, the type that one would find on um, baby grow suits. So we believed that the family had all been put into the ground at that point. From that moment on, the entire investigation changed focus and became a Category A, which is the highest category of, of murder inquiry. Kenneth Regan, obviously from that point on, became prime suspect. At that stage, Regan's whereabouts were unknown, as were Hauntsy's. Um, they were very much um, on the loose, so to speak. I was a bit overcome by the whole thing, really, and I don't really know what I thought, but it never sort of... Maybe I just didn't want to think that somebody had been buried in my field. So I tried to make myself busy, and I noticed that my horse had ripped its horse blanket. So I took it off the horse, put it in the car, and I drove up the lane. 
and lo and behold, I bumped into Regan and Hornsey, who were in a car. I was really shocked to see them. And Regan wound the window down. And I said to him, what are you doing here? And he said, we need to have a little chat. And Hornsey then said, why didn't you get in the car? We'll go and have a coffee. And I thought, well, I don't want to get in the car with them. So I had the horse blanket next to me, and there was a little cottage just up. And I said, I I've got to take this back. I've borrowed this from, you know, pointing to that. I've got to take it back, and they were expecting it back. I'll be back in two minutes, I said. So they said, OK. So I drove off, and I drove round the corner, and I phoned D.I. Rao, and he said, whatever you do, don't get in the car with them. So I said, OK. He said, I'm going to send two police officers back. Two police officers arrived, but Regan and Hornsey had gone. Regan and Hornsey had escaped to Europe, leaving Peter Rees behind. But alone and on the run, Rees developed a guilty conscience. I think he was cornered. He, he didn't know me from Adam. He just came in, sat down, and more or less started pouring his heart out. At the time, Wendy Powells was staying at a boarding house when a new lodger moved in. Within hours, Reese made a startling confession. I just took him as any, you know, new lodger that came there. Until he started saying, have I seen him on TV? And I said, no, should I have done? And so I just wondered, he said, because I have been on TV, and I, I, I thought, He's not a celebrity or anything, you know, he didn't look that way. And he just said that he was involved with an Asian family that had disappeared. They could put me at the scene of where the bodies were buried, but I, did, I, didn't, I didn't kill anybody. He was going, I, I'm, I, you know, they can't do that, they can't pin that on me. And I, I'd say to him, you know, what is going on, you know? He just said that Regan was crazy because he killed two children. I, I gasped and I, and I said, how did you, uh, he, he, were they killed? He said that Regan had shot them. It was Regan, he's a psycho, he said. He, he, he killed them all. I knew what I had to do because uh, how many people come to your home every day and say they've killed five people and two babies? Well. three adults and two babies. Wendy Powell's alerted the police, and after just 12 days on the run, Peter Reese was arrested at a nearby pub. Despite his confession to Wendy Powell's, Reese refused to answer any questions, and the whereabouts of the Chowan family remained a mystery. But three weeks later, a fisherman discovered another body floating in the Solent. I was told that Nancy's body was decomposed, but I insisted on seeing the body because for me it was not a skeleton. For me it was my baby sister. For me she was, she, she was still alive and I was talking to her. And that was it. Tearful goodbye, that's what I said. I, I felt sorry that I couldn't save her. I did say that, Nancy, I tried my best, but I couldn't save you. Kenneth Regan was tracked down by police in Belgium after two months on the run. And just six weeks later, William Hornsey gave himself up. The three prime suspects were now in custody, but they refused to answer any questions. With three family members still missing and no witnesses to the murders, police needed hard evidence to link their suspects to the crime. Little did they realize that the vital clue they needed had been left by Neil Chowan himself. April 2005 saw the start of the longest criminal trial in the history of the Old Bailey. 
Police were trying to prove that Kenneth Regan, William Hornsey, and Peter Rees had abducted and murdered all five members of the Chowan family. The nine-month trial saw almost 4,500 different exhibits, from financial transactions to petrol receipts. But it was telephone tracking evidence which provided the foundation for the whole case. We got ourselves into a position where we pretty much knew exactly what had gone on and uh, could give a very clear indication to the trial um, the enormity of the crime and, and who'd committed it. Initially, police had established Regan and Chowan's movements by tracking their mobiles. Once they gained access to Hornsey and Reese's phones, they had compelling evidence for an abduction. Our telephone intelligence had suggested that Mr. Chohan had been with Mr. Regan, Hornsey and Reese. And then the telephones traveled down to Wilton in Salisbury, namely Three Forge Close, which was Ken Regan's home address over the critical period when Mr. Chohan had initially been, had gone missing. There was never a time that one of those telephones wasn't in that area, leading us to believe he was being guarded at number three, Forge Close. All the men could now be placed at the scene but detectives still needed further clues as to what really happened at Three Forge Close. In the run-up to the trial, they unexpectedly received some vital new evidence from one of the suspect's own relatives. Mr Hornsey's son um, approached police and produced to us a Lexmark colour printer um, and also this grey uh, suitcase, um, which contained uh, a number of pieces of A4 paper uh, with Mr Chohan's signature on. The printer and documents from Hornsey's suitcase explained how Regan had managed to convince the staff at Sieber that Neil Chowan had sold the company and left the country. Police argued that Neil Chowan was held at Three Forge Close so Regan could force him to sign the documents under duress. What are you playing at? What are you doing? Just fucking sign it. The suitcase contained 10 blank sheets with Chowan's signature. Spares which Regan could have used to produce other forgeries if they were needed. Regan's initial plan was to get rid of Anil Chohan. I think once he'd gone down that road, he was left in a position where he had to murder the entire family because he knew that had he not done so, that Nancy would have raised the alarm. We could see clearly from the telephone intelligence that while Mr. Rees remained in Salisbury, Regan and Hornsey traveled to London to uh, Sutton Road, Hounslow, where they spent several hours. I can only guess, but it's possible that that is when the family met their deaths in that address. I don't know that to date. What I can say is that Regan and Hornsey were in that area, and I can say that the family disappeared on that day. For Mr Regan, these murders were something he had to do to get what he wanted. And it was meant it almost as meant little to him as as changing his shirt. The police were unable to establish precisely where or when the family were murdered, but they were convinced that Neil Chowan had been killed at Regan's bungalow. The problem was proving it. We carried out a full forensic examination of the premises over many days. Um, there was nothing uh, significantly found there. The reasons for this was that uh, the room had been recently decorated, um, and certainly the furniture from that room um, was certainly removed and uh, Mr. Regan had uh, replaced it uh, immediately with new furniture. The fact that the premises had been redecorated, the carpet had been removed, the sofa had been removed, 
really was clearly indicative of someone trying to conceal evidence and clean up a crime scene. But despite the suspicious activity at the house, it was not proof that Chowen had been murdered by Regan. It was only a single extraordinary piece of evidence that would convince the jury beyond reasonable doubt, a clue which had been initially overlooked by the scientists and left in storage for almost eight months, a clue left by Neil Chowen himself. We have two exhibits here. One is a, the right sock of Mr Chohan, which was taken from him um, at the post-mortem down in Dorset. Most of the clothes were submitted immediately to the Forensic Science Service uh, for examination, um, but uh, socks normally is very little evidential value in socks, um, but for completeness, um, we decided to send the remaining items of clothing to the scientist who had requested them. When the scientists uh, unpackaged the sock um, and examined it, um, inside was found a folded piece of paper. As you can see, it's in a very delicate state. Um, it has been dried, um, but uh, it's obviously been in the seawater. Uh, I think the way it's been folded so many times has, has protected it. And it's a letter from the Cheltenham and Gloucester Building Society, and it's addressed to uh, Mr Regan of number three, Forge Close. And it's dated the 12th of February, 2003. Um, which clearly meant it arrived the day we believe Mr Chohan was being held captive at Forge Close. You can only imagine the fear that Mr Chohan would have been in to secret this in his person and certainly to put it into his sock. Um, he, he must have realised that um, he, he faced imminent death. Of course, it's overwhelming evidence of the message that Mr Chohan was trying to send from beyond the grave as to who had, who had actually murdered him. After a nine-month trial, the jury reached a unanimous verdict. Peter Rees was sentenced to 23 years for the murder of Neil Chowan. Hornsey and Regan each received five consecutive life sentences for murdering the Chowan family. They will never be released from prison. The remains of Charanjit Kaur, Neil Chowan's mother-in-law, were eventually found off the coast of the Isle of Wight. But the bodies of the two babies, 18-month-old Davinda and eight-week-old Ravinda, have never been found. I think that the, the killing of any child is extremely tragic. And I think as a police officer, having investigated such crimes, you can normally see a reason why that happened. Someone snapped, someone was depressed, someone was mentally ill. And there's normally a variety of motivations for a child being murdered. In these circumstances, the motivation was purely self-gain and greed, and for me, I found that uh, particularly horrific. I, I still have nightmares about how the killers might have killed Nancy or who was killed first. Was Nancy killed in front of my mom? Or my mom killed in front of Nancy? 
or the kid killed in front of mom and Nancy. And it's, it's just very hard, you know. And I don't think I'll ever be able to come to terms with it. Onka returned to New Zealand. He would never meet his sister's children. The only time he saw them all together was on a family video he found in their empty home. When I found Nancy's video, it was filmed just two days before the disappearance. Hello. Nina, 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 Nina. And I could see in the video the family celebrating life and the kids playing in the house. Joy, the eldest son. He took his first steps in the video, and my mom, she was very happy in the video. <laughs> when I had a look at the video, I was very happy, you know, because I never actually saw Anil and Nancy living together. Do it properly, Gardner. Very nice. But through that video, I came to know that Nancy was very happy with Anil, and she was, you know, she was very lucky to have a guy like Anil with her. Every time I close my eyes, I can, I can see Nancy smiling, and as if nothing has happened, she's still there, and she's waiting for me to come over. <laughs> 